you, you know, I mean, we've said this before. Uh, like, I, I know I've, I've beat this one uh, to death, but you know, if if we could, along with other things that like Terrell was saying, we could bump the, uh, uh, you know, just the pay grades up, like one pay grade in the MTO, that could go a long ways to keeping retaining uh, talent and creating, you know, room for career progression on on the administrative side of the house. And then on on the operational side of the house, you know, uh, you know, when you're you're a E four E five trying to br- brief a battalion staff on something. <laughs> You could be you could pe- be preaching the gospel according to Jesus Himself, and those dudes are going to doubt what you say simply because of your rank. I'm not saying it's the right, you know, thing. It's just that that's just the way it is. Now, if we were to take those uh, same positions, bump them up more, and say you've got an E8, like a master sergeant, maybe like in charge of a section, your your team leaders are, are E6s or E7s, even you know, if we're going to dream. Uh, Coming from some some staff sergeant, some sergeant first class, and master sergeant, that carries a lot more weight when you're trying to uh, you know pitch a mission when you're trying to trying to do that kind of stuff operationally versus hey uh, buck sergeant so snuffy and you know uh, especially so and so are here to brief their piece of the mission and when the commander's going to look at that and be like uh, I don't know what you guys are capable of but I'm seeing two young ass uh, you know. A, a junior NCO and a Joe here telling me that they're going to be off on their own supporting us. Eh, that's the Not reaction that you're going to get. Not going to happen. No, that, I, I, I doubt it. Yeah. That, that's where I, I, I still say we have to go back and redesign everything, make it an MOS, uh, take the snipers out of the battalions, put them at brigade level. So that way the brigade commanders overall in charge of them give them a senior captain that's already had a company command as a company commander in the, in the brigade. He runs them just like the, like the old days when they had a BRT brigade reconnaissance troop. Now you have a, a brigade set of snipers, they're a brigade asset. They are your most, you know, direct casually, casually producing, you know, intelligence gathering people that you have in your entire brigade. Use them well use them wisely don't squander their knowledge don't squander their talents he had this group of guys break it down so each uh that's run by a captain and a master sergeant first slash first sergeant now you have each uh each battalion would have a section or a platoon attached to them so now you could now since they're attached from the brigade level if say for example uh Normally, these guys normally work with 115. Now, instead of working with 115, we send two, three teams of 115 and one team down to 269. Why? Because 269 is in a hot area. We flex them over. Instead of how it is right now, uh, a guy, guys could be at their battalion doing nothing. Nothing's going on in, in their sector. And three streets over is another battalion sector. Everything goes on over there. They can't get in a fight because their battalion will not allow them to go work with that other battalion. That doesn't make any sense to me. You only got so many of these guys. Use them wisely. You know, make a good rotation for them. You know, how are you snipers has kind of shifted over over the last few years? You know, the idea is what we can do. We used to have a, cor- a course, a sniper appointment leaders course, that talked about how you use snipers and what they can do and what they can't do. We took uh, lieutenants, captains, majors out to the range and let them shoot a 50 cal, you know, let them shoot the M107. We actually had them walk from the, from sniper school out Good Luck Road out to Coolidge, which is about two and a half, almost three mile walk out there. So they walked three miles out there carrying this 34 pound rifle and they figure out immediately that this is not what they want to do because it's not fun. So once they figure out that now they, and they get to shoot it and they figure out, Hey, the M107 is a anti-material rifle. It's good at shooting trucks, bunkers, houses, airplanes that are on the ground, stuff designed to shoot scuds, things like that. It's not designed to engage enemy personnel. Why? Because 
personnel, you're talking, it's a 600 meter gun because it's a three. Remember we talked about minutes earlier. So a five minute gun, uh, five minutes at six is how much? Six times five is 30. Well, it's, that's 30 inches. So basically it'll hit somewhere within this 30 inch circle. Good luck with that. Not really what you want for 34 pounds to carry around without ammo. So lieutenants would figure that out. Where not am I going with all this? Everybody exactly where you're at as soon as you shoot. Oh, not to mention, you know, the concussive blast gives you headaches for days from it. You know, got to go to the audiologist. Why? Because I can't hear because I used to be on the 50 cal range every, every couple of weeks. But get these programs back in place, get it going. We've shifted how we use how we use snipers. You know, gone are the days of two guys out by themselves in the woods, you know, crawling around, whatever. Now, now it's, hey, the unit's going to go do a raid. Sniper's going to go in a couple hours beforehand, climb to the top of this building, watch. And when the unit goes down, kicks down doors, does a raid, and he squirters that run, snipers should engage the squirters that run. That's how it's, that's what happens these days. Or we're still in the mountains, still get up high, looking far. You know, the sniper's mission is not just to engage enemy personnel and, and, and targets. It's also to engage, you know, to provide battlefield intelligence. We have to remember that, you know, these guys, we have optics. We have a whole plan of how we record data and how we find small items and items and tune our eyes so we can see things out there. So we have to use that capability as well. So there's a whole lot of capabilities that we're squandering because we're letting these guys be a sniper for one tour, paying all this money to send them to a sniper school for one tour. One of the, uh, one of the best, Best things that I was able to do was actually get into the SELC or you know the Sniper Employment Leaders course you mentioned earlier uh, as a young NCO, and it gave me the opportunity. One, I was surrounded by all these jackass officers who did not understand how to employ their snipers, and I could see the reaction and then know, okay, this is what my company commander legitimately thinks, you know. Um, and that was eye opening in a lot of ways because you're like, okay, I can't believe you honestly thought you could drop me off a thousand yards away and I would own anything in that city. Like, let's apply a little bit of, of common sense here. Um, a dude who's right out of school is not Chris Kyle, um, no matter what he may tell you. Um, and then B, it also gave me the opportunity to learn how to present the information that I needed to learn to the commander to understand the value of charts and graphs and, you know, um, speak officer ease instead of NCO ease so that you could get that relationship built with them. Because it's exactly like we mentioned earlier, when you're young in the NCO and you're trying to stand up in front of the old man and say, Hey, you know, I can support your operation and he can look to the left and right and you can see all these senior NCOs who he knows and trusts and who've got decades of experience. He's going to look at you as a young E5 or E6 and be like, what are you talking about? I should drop you off with your team and you're going to do some shit? No. But SELT gives you the opportunity to learn how to present that, how you need to develop that um, relationship, and then also how to develop a sustainment uh, training plan for your snipers. And when I left SELC, um, one of the things that I did was try to go and get every bit of information I could on the POI, um, the grading schemes, uh, previous uh, sniper section um, SOPs, everything we could get to build that knowledge base to give back to the section. And I've still got NCOs who are in sections who are using SOPs that I wrote when I was um, the sniper employment uh, leader. You know, it's an impossible hurdle if you're not using that resource. And unfortunately, self was a great army shit on and took away. Yeah. 
No, and that that was something that I they really really almost and I I can't speak to the eight week course, um, but I imagine it it hasn't gotten hit on just because it's it's kind of one of those uh, it, the the esoteric side of things that uh, you you generally don't get hit on when you're trying to impart the basic you know fundamentals of your job in a, in a training class. But that was something that I struggled with because I had no NCOs in my sphere of influence um, that were good at or had any idea at how to produce a decent training curriculum, whether it be shooting, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't matter, uh, whether it be shooting, whether it be, you know, the reconnaissance side of things, um, they had no concept of how to put together a relevant training plan in terms of let's actually produce good results. Instead, it was, how can we come up with some sort of operation that makes us look good in the eyes of command so they can give us more stuff later? And I, I think that was uh, approaching it from the, the wrong end of the, the spectrum. Yeah, you know, I mean, having that tact, developing that relationship with the, uh, the commander and doing all the things that, that Adam was just talking about, um, man, that is key, you know, and, and it doesn't help when you just, just as, as soon as you get that good working relationship with the, uh, you know, whether it be the battalion commander or, or whoever you're working for, just about what the time when you do get a good relationship going on with them, they move on to another command. So then uh, you're starting off from, from scratch again. If you happen to be still, in the section, if you're a team leader, section leader, or whatever, and uh, you know, I mean, you're, you're constantly having to rebuild that relationship again. Uh, and I, I've, I've myself have done that before uh, more than a few times. And I think where where a lot of guys fall apart is uh, they don't they don't know how to approach that, and they 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 end up building a wall there, uh, maybe inadvertently. And which ends up just boxing them in and, and uh, leading to the problems we were talking about before, how they, they don't get the freedom of, of, of movement that they should have. They don't have the support that they should have, all these other little problems and stuff. And so as, as, as NCOs in the sniper section, we need to be proactive about trying to establish those relationships. Yeah, there, there is a lack of uh, uh, institutionally um, established programs. Uh, for them to learn how to employ us. But in in the interim, before any of that stuff really happens, before all these big changes happens, uh, we need to be proactive about making that stuff kind of, you know, happen for us. Uh, you got to go out and you got to start, you know, working with them. And I know it sounds like a, it can be an intimidating thing for some guys. It can be, you know, even uh, not necessarily what you would normally do, especially guys that are coming from like line units. You know, you don't just go up to, the higher ranking guys and just be like, Hey, what's up, bro? Uh, here's a, here's a training plan that I want to roll through you. It's, it's not going to work like that, but being as forthcoming, you know, working with them and, and trying to uh, get a good working relationship going on. Um, and, and we were talking about this the other night, same thing with your, with your S3, with your ops guys and, you know, building these working relationships. I mean, I, I've gotten more done that way. Well, not just by uh, not just by being able to do it, but by by necessity of trying to get stuff done and get my guys training and get them resources and ranges and ammo, all that stuff. Uh, you know, you, you got to be proactive in trying to seek that stuff out. And uh, until the army finally figures out, hey, we need to establish this as a working, uh, you know, method of doing things. It's going to be on the individual sniper uh, NCOs in the section, which which sucks. It absolutely does because it shouldn't be that way. But the reality of it is we're going to have to do that. Um, you know, if you want to get your guys good training, if you want to keep them prepared, that's just, you know, I don't have a good answer uh, as to, uh, you know, the solution right now in, in the, in the you know, next, uh, you know, short term period. But for now, that's what it's got to be. Yeah, unfortunately, it comes down to us being like, hey, you know, trying to, to, you know, 
cup of the balls, stroke the shaft, drink the gravy when it comes to trying to, uh, you know, convince them of our capabilities. So you kind of got to razzle dazzle them a little bit and then, and maybe get them behind guns and, and maybe give them that, like that actual picture of this is what we can do. This is what we can't because you've seen what you can't do behind said gun. This is now, and then you demonstrate what you can do beyond what they can do. And then hopefully you kind of pray, you know, sacrifice a chicken and maybe hope that they meet in the center. But uh, it's not always the case. Sometimes they're just like, oh, I was buying a sniper rifle. This is awesome. They're not actually connecting the dots in terms of what you're trying to, to, to tell them, even if you do a back brief with them to, to say, hey, look, this is, this is uh, the reality of what we can do. You know, this is, this is the reality of what the rifles are capable of. Um, we can do a lot more than just what the rifles are, are there or, or what they're actually able to do. Um, it, it's, it's tough because you, you, it, it, the way that sniper battalions or not battalions, I wish, um, the way that sniper units are constructed right now, it relies heavily upon the chain of command being trustful of the guys that they're employing to do that. And unfortunately, because a lot of the sniper battalion, or I keep saying battalions, the sniper section. Well, thinking. Yeah, right. Uh, the uh, Freudian slip. Um, the a lot of these sniper sections are unfortunately limited by the trust that their battalions place in them, and it it, it you get a a huge displacement of skill and ability within that. You know, there's entire sections of your command, especially for uh, for uh, combined arms units. You know, that are that are rocking Bradleys and tanks. That you can't even convince the other NCOs that you're you're relevant, and you're in the, at the same time you're like, okay, so what's the the general trend over the last decade of warfare that we've had? When have you used your your Abrams? Maybe for half of that. And then it got, you know, shut down. And now because of collateral damage, you're looking at the reality of precise engagements being the predominant, you know, net benefit, not demolishing a house with a, a 105, as awesome as that is. That's the reality. You're not rolling out of there with your, your Abrams. You're rolling out of there in an in a 1151 or a striker, just like, every other shit sling grunt. So please tell me how my mission is not applicable to your battle space. But unfortunately, when you approach it like that, they, they shit on you and, and you're back to square one. So it's uh, being able to talk to commandees, you know, so you can kind of integrate those two lingos together uh, is, is something that I, I think is, is done a disservice at, at both sniper schools. Full stop.